starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the penultimate session in our CHFP review webinar series. I'm Brad Adams. I am the website chair for Tennessee HFMA, um, and I am coming to you from lovely and overcast and rainy Nashville, Tennessee, this morning. Um, so a couple of quick housekeeping things. You all are probably used to this by now, but if you want to earn CPE for these sessions, remember you need to stay connected for at least 90% of the time and respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions that will be given throughout the session. Um, we will be making recording of the session just like we have the, the prior three, and they'll be posted usually by the end of the day tomorrow, um, and you can find those at tnhfma.org forward slash chfp hyphen webinars, or you can go to the Tennessee HFMA YouTube channel as well. That's where that'll be posted. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Christoph so he can get, get us going this morning. Thank you very much, Brad. I hope I'm coming in loud and clear. I hope you can all see my screen. Thank you again for um, making time in your busy day to think about certification. Um, we have three more topics to cover today, and I'm going to lead us off by talking about the quantitative topics, um, the ones that um, I feel are uh, maybe underrepresented uh, by the on online study guide and that uh, might help you uh, clinch the exam. We're going to start right in on this and then uh, uh, go in order, but we're going to start with the quantitative stuff this time. And uh, the topic that I want to talk about is uh, disbursements, which is really the last topic um, in the curriculum and uh, one that frequently gets the least amount of attention. Uh, what are we talking about when we talk about disbursements? We're talking about all of the kinds of functions in an organization that disperse money, which are accounts payable, payroll, and um, inventory, uh, supplies and inventory. And then that last topic is really part of uh, materials management or if you were looking for uh, yet another term, uh, supply chain. So those are the topics that are talked about in, uh, that's really what disbursements is all about. Now in the book that you have, uh, those are also the topics that uh, are covered there. Um, but there is one topic in the book that is not on the exam. And uh, if you f don't feel like you want to read it, you, uh, you can safely skip it. And that's the section at the very end of the disbursement section that talks about um, um, timekeeping and the Fair Labor Standards Act, specifically how overtime is computed. We'll come back to that in a minute. We want to go, though, right now into the quantitative topic here that we want to cover, which has to do with uh, inventory valuation. Uh, you remember from the first uh, webinar that inventory is really not a big deal for a healthcare organization. Let me just prove that to you by going back to the very uh, financial statements that we looked at. Um, and we need to look at the um, current asset section here to, to see that to be the case. Notice that uh, of, of our $2.3 billion of current assets, our supplies inventory is only $123 million. So why would we even bother to spend time on this uh, in a curriculum like this? I don't know, but uh, inventory valuation happens to be a topic tested on the exam, so I think we should cover it. Now, remember that <clears throat> we don't make anything in healthcare. We use uh, inventory, supplies inventory, only to produce healthcare. It's, a, it's a, a cost item, a very small one, compared to, say, uh, a labor that goes into healthcare. And you see that here if you look at uh, 
the income statement where labor is uh, 3.1 billion, employee benefits are another 800 million, and you have a bunch of other things. You do see supplies here stick out. It is a big number uh, that flows through the organization uh, rather rapidly, but from an inventory point of view of what's actually held in storerooms and so forth, it's really not a lot of money because we turn it around relatively quickly. So. Uh, there are several ways to value inventory. So what are we talking about? We're talking about ways of measuring what the stuff that's sitting in the supply room, in the storeroom, is actually worth, since we're constantly buying and dispensing um, uh, uh, supplies. How do you um, value what goes out the door uh, and is used and how do you value what's still on the shelf at the balance sheet date or whenever you take inventory in an organization and uh, how do you value it particularly in environment where prices change where prices are not the same so look at the data here uh, on March the 2nd we bought 2,000 units of uh, something at four dollars. So we now have uh, 2,000 uh, units on the shelf pretending we started with nothing. On uh, March the 15th we bought 6,000 more uh, but the price had gone up a little bit meanwhile so now we have 8,000 units on the shelf. On March 19th you see this is all very hypothetical. This is not how it would work in real life. We used 4,000 uh, 8,000 minus 4,000, we have 4,000 left. On March the 30th, we bought 2,000 more and we paid yet a different price. So those are the facts and how do you handle this from a, an accounting point of view? There's four ways in which uh, this can be handled. Either you basically tag every single item and whichever item you take off the shelf uh, gets dispensed at the whatever price you paid for it. Um, that uh, would apply to higher priced items or stickered items where you have the ability to actually sticker something and uh, I identify it specifically, not just generically, but specifically. Um, the, mm, another way of doing it is by weighted average, and that is simply to take an average price average purchase price here and then value what's left the 6,000 units at that average price and dispense the 4,000 units that you used again at the average price. Now there are a couple of other methods first in first out and last in first out they have nothing to do with how the goods are actually used it doesn't mean that the last item uh, is used first the newest item and, and thus what's left on the shelf is is old, uh, which uh, would be um, uh, suggested by this first method, first in, first out. Uh, and, and likewise, the last in, first out, which would mean the, the uh, I take that, I take that back. I, I told you this the wrong way around. Last in, first out would be the method where the newest item comes out first and what's left is old. That's really not how it works and it doesn't necessarily work in, in the first in first out either in that the oldest item is the item that gets used first. These are merely accounting conventions. So let's see what HFMA Health System does. Um, hey hey Christoph. Checking this out. Yes. Hey we'd had um, right, so, so somebody uh, mentioned they're having a little bit of trouble hearing. I don't know if you could move the mic a little bit closer or uh, turn up the gain on it. Okay, hang on a second. Let me uh, see what I can do. Okay, thank you. Microphone. Okay. Speakers. Speak. Hello, hello. I'm You're sure still there. I turn this puppy over. I'm still here. Okay, yeah. I can turn the speakers up. I can yeah. make myself louder, but that's not... <laughs> I don't seem to have a way to do that. Well, I'm going to speak. Uh, my voice carries pretty well anyhow, but my uh, but I'm going to speak up, and if there's still a problem, then I will call in. Is that fair? 
sounds good. So if anybody okay. else is still having issues, just post it in the questions box yes, so we please, know to let Christoph know. Okay, so I'm just scrolling through the uh, uh, footnotes here. I know it's in here, it's just that I'm having trouble finding it. Net assets, depreciation, inventory. Here we go. Supplies inventory is stated at the lower of cost, first in, first out. So in other words, uh, that's the accounting convention that HFMA Health System chose to uh, handle its inventory. Okay, so let's see how this actually works in, in, in an example. So here is, these are these uh, um, uh, uh, two methods. The first in, first out is the one used by uh, HFMA Health System. So uh, they, <clears throat> what it means is the first item in is the first item to go out. So the uh, um, items that go out are going to be um, four, 2,000 of the oldest items. And you notice here they were bought at $4, at $4 each. So those are the ones that go out, 2,000 at $4. But a, a total of 4,000 were used, you see that here. So we need to grab another 2,000 and we're going to grab those out of this tranche here uh, uh, that was bought on March the 15th at 440. So 2,000 at 4 plus 2,000 at 440, that's the value of the items used. And then the inventory gets stated uh, at <clears throat> what then is left, uh, namely 2,000 items that were bought at 415 and 2,000 items that were bought at 440. That's how, pardon me, I need to get a little drink of water here. Pardon me. LIFO, last in, first out, works the other way around. You can see that here. I'm not going to walk us through that example. Weighted average, this is the one you are more most likely to see on the exam. So let's look at this one. So what is weighted average? It's really the average of all of the prices that, that uh, uh, the purchase prices that are sitting, <clears throat> sitting there on the shelf at, at any given time. So we used 4,000 and we're going to have to figure out the average price. It's a weighted average, which means that 2,000 items get uh, valued at $4, 6,000 at 440 and 2,000 at 415. You add uh, those together, that's 10,000 items that you see that here in the denominator. Make that a little bit bigger. And what sits in the numerator is what you actually paid for those items, which is the total of 8,000, 26,000, uh, and uh, 8,300, namely 42,700. And so the average, the weighted average uh, value of that inventory is 427 which is what you use both to um, uh, price what you used, 4,000 times 427, but you also use that to value the inventory that's still on the shelf, 427, so you come up with 25,600 there for the inventory. Let's compare the amounts. So under the first case, uh, the inventory, the ending inventory is worth 25,009, um, the ending inventory under the other method, LIFO is 25.6, and here it's 25.620. So what, what you're seeing is that um, the, these numbers really don't uh, vary a great deal. And the same with the items of the value sold here, 17,080, here it's 16,800, and here it's 17,100. Now, the numbers, of course, on the expense side can get big, so uh, it, it's less important to value the inventory than to value what you expensed. So even the name of this is a little misleading. We're not really so much interested in valuing the little bit we have on the shelf in, in our healthcare organization, but the, all of the stuff that we used. Okay, so that's a, a very, very quick look at inventory valuation, or really as it maybe should be called, supply supply cost uh, evaluation. And we're going to move on to the last uh, quantitative topic uh, worth talking about here. And then we're going to go to all the non-quantitative non stuff. And the last topic we should talk about 
has to do with, uh, and there's a case study, by the way, here. If you wanted to practice uh, using all of the, the methods that are worth uh, uh, learning because they're quantitative, which is weighted average FIFO and LIFO. Here's the example having to do with purchasing lactated ringers. and It's maybe a little bit more realistic. I don't know. So that be that as it may, now we're going to come to um, talking about uh, FTEs and uh, what is an FTE. An FTE is uh, 1.0 FTE is someone who works uh, all of the uh, hours in their pay period, um, which would be 40 hours or 80 hours, depending on how the pay period is defined. And productive FTEs would then be the uh, actually the worked hours uh, in relationship to total working hours and the non-productive FTEs would be the paid but not worked hours to total worked hours. That in and of itself uh, uh, is less um, compelling than looking at it this way, which is a very simple table that crosswalks a paid FTE to a uh, productive FTE, paid FTE here in the first row. A paid FTE would work eight hours a day, 2,800 hours a year. Uh, if you uh, brought it down to an hours per month, it would be 173 hours uh, on average. It depend, uh, you know, it's, it's really different uh, depending on how long the month is. And then given just a plain average month, it would be 21 and two-thirds uh, working days. Um, and there, under this system, there are 260 working days, 52 weeks in the year times five working days uh, a week. So this is a pretty standard uh, uh, nine to five or Monday through Friday FTE. Now this person working in healthcare uh, or in any other organization has PTO, holidays, vacation, sick time, sometimes uh, uh, broken into different uh, categories or sometimes not. Uh, for this employee, it would be 20 uh, work days a, a year, five weeks essentially, uh, and then this is what that turns out to be. That's 160 hours and, uh, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, here uh, is an interesting little tidbit. If you factor in the half an hour of uh, break times that uh, people are entitled to under the Fair Labor Standards Act, if they work an eight-hour shift, uh, that's 15 minutes times two, that actually amounts to 120 hours a, a year. That's a lot of hours if you think about it. Uh, uh, actually, this is four weeks here. I misspoke. Four weeks times five is 160 hours. So this is a four-week PTO time. So that's 120 extra hours just uh, uh, lost on breaks if people take them as they're supposed to. And that comes down to a productive FTE of 1,800 hours a year, uh, seven and a half a day, etc. Okay, so how might you use this very simple information, it basically means that uh, if you want to staff uh, uh, a, uh, an operation uh, by uh, uh, someone there uh, a certain number of hours per day or week, you need to have more paid FTEs than you have productive FTEs. And here is what that, in this particular case, um, boils down to 15% more FTEs than you then to, 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 to cover the shifts uh, given that people have PTO. Uh, there is uh, an example in a case study that looks like uh, this. Um, and it is described, the text of it is described here. Let me go to it. Okay, here is the text of it, and I'm not going to do this case study with you here, but encourage you to work on this on your own. And the, the case study is in the case study section in your book. So you're the director of the revenue cycle, and you are uh, wanting to create a telephone customer service unit for incoming calls. This is something that you haven't had before in the past. 
people uh, in, in collections answered the calls uh, as they were able. You want to uh, bring down the wait times that people spend in, on hold by staffing your, your own dedicated unit and you know that the hours you want uh, uh, this, uh, patients to be able to call in are 8 to 8. So it's very customer friendly. You also want to give them four hours on Saturdays to be able to reach the, the hospital's business office. So from nine to one, you also want to be staffed. And uh, you also know that your existing staff can only handle a limited number of calls. You know that uh, best practices are 95 calls a day. And you know that with some training, you're going to get them uh, to uh, 95 days uh, calls a day. So you uh, have six staff available and rather than pay staff overtime, you're going to use uh, temporary staff. They are also only able to handle 60 calls per hour, uh, uh, 60 calls per day, sorry, this should say per day, until the productivity reaches 95 uh, calls. And so how many FTEs do you need to do this? Uh, so let's take a look at the calculation here or the way the problem is set up right here. Okay, so we here's our call volume. I'll make this bigger so you can see it. Here's the number of calls we know that come in, 2,200 calls a week. And we have six uh, paid FTEs available to us. We want to be staffed 12 hours a day and four hours on Saturdays for a total of 64 hours and then we have some assumptions uh, about how many productive hours people actually work. It's uh, 1900 in this case they work uh, staggered shifts to cover all of the hours. Some staff will have to uh, work on Saturdays. This temporary staff will be eliminated as productivity increases and once the call center is fully productive internal sh staff will shift back to other tasks when not busy. So here are then, uh, when the call center opens, this is what you need. You need to have uh, uh, this many temporary staff. This is what your model tells you. And then as the center is fully staffed, what does the picture look like then? I'm just going to fast forward here to the solution and show you what it is. It basically, under this scenario, you can eliminate the temporary staff. And then you just do a little bit of shifting around of staff, um, which is what you're doing here. Uh, uh, you know, you're having people work a little less on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, in order to create the capacity that you need on Saturdays, which is 1.5 FTEs. And then uh, uh, you can see is there going to be time left over to do other th things or not. So a model like this is very useful in the real world uh, and uh, is a quantitative topic. So I bring it up here, or, uh, although this is a way more complicated uh, kind of problem that you would then what you would see on the exam. But I think this is a pretty realistic one. And maybe this is useful for you in, in, in in any case, the, the goal of the, these practicum webinars is to uh, relate this curriculum to something practical. So hopefully that's uh, going to be helpful for you. So that's all I have on quantitative topics. And I want to pause here for a moment to see if there are any questions, any chat. Uh, Christoph, um, nope, haven't been any questions that have come in that uh, we weren't able to answer uh, directly. Okay. All right, very good. Then what I'm going to do is uh, uh, take us through the materials in, uh, in order now. And we're going to start with internal control. And I'm going to have to do kind of a guess here what page to go to. Yes, here we go. OK. So here we go. So now we're talking about compliance and uh, internal control. So what are we talking about here? Internal control and compliance. I mean, in healthcare, uh, those two things uh, belong very, very closely together. I'm going to scoot us back here to the slides that pertain to it. 
So what is internal control? Here's a classic definition of internal control on the left. Um, and uh, what are the magic words here? The magic words are safeguarding of assets, right here. Checking the accuracy of accounting data, that's number two. Promoting operational efficiency, which is kind of a surprise. You wouldn't think that internal control has to do with efficiency, but it does. And then the last one is encouraging adherence to managerial policy. So that's those are the classic four elements of internal control. Um, the uh, internal controls uh, are further, though, divided into two um, classes, administrative controls, that's where the efficiency and the policies come in, which we just saw on the prior page. Those are administrative controls that uh, have kind of an overarching, over uh, uh, sort of a higher level um, uh, import. The accounting controls are the bread and butter of internal controls because they control the thousands and millions of transactions that uh, occur in an, in, in an enterprise. And transactions um, uh, need to be controlled in four different ways. First of all, they have to be authorized. In other words, uh, unauthorized transactions should not occur in an organization. What that, for instance, means is that the business office uh, 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 collector can't write off a neighbor's balance. Okay, without authorization, can't do that. Uh, second of all, transactions are recorded. So nothing occurs off the books, uh, but everything that happens is recorded. Okay, uh, access to assets is, an, is, a, is a third uh, principle of uh, transaction controls, and that means that incompatible uh, uh, duties are not performed by the same person. And then lastly, every once in a while you do an audit. And we just a moment ago talked about inventory and you do an inventory count uh, maybe monthly in the organization just to make sure that what's on the shelf is actually uh, what's supposed to be on the shelf and uh, uh, you don't ha have either more or less on the shelf, frequently it would be less. But uh, that's, those are the four things that you then have to check for. Let's talk about access to assets in, uh, for a moment here, because that topic is uh, um, one that uh, uh, sometimes gets violated in real life. Uh, the other term for this is segregation of duties. That's the other magic word that describes access to assets. Let's talk about what that would look like, say, in a purchasing organization. So let's say uh, the uh, the lab manager uh, wants to buy uh, uh, lab uh, supplies and uh, uh, goes to purchasing and says, I need to uh, place this big order for lab uh, consumables, say petri dishes, let's say. And uh, so what does purchasing do? Purchasing creates a purchase order, which uh, uh, basically uh, uh, says to the vendor, I, uh, I order this uh, from you, these Petri dishes from you, and I'm authorized to do that because this is a, an official purchase order and I'm buying, you know, 500 Petri dishes at uh, 50 cents each. So, so that's the, the, the contract that, that we have uh, uh, here to purchase supplies. Uh, the vendor then fills that order and ships the 500 Petri dishes and uh, the receiving dog gets, uh, gets the box and uh, gets a copy of the purchase order um, and uh, the copy is blinded so you can't see on the copy how many uh, uh, Petri dishes were actually ordered. That forces this uh, person at the dock to count the boxes of Petri dishes to make sure that there really are 500 that were delivered and not 450 or 600. And then uh, the paperwork from uh, uh, materials management with the purchase order and the report from the loading dock goes to accounts payable 
uh, that uh, then pays the invoice. So the segregation of duties in this case is threefold. It's between the ordering person in uh, uh, materials management, it's between the uh, storeroom person at the loading dock, and it's between the person that pays the bill. That's called a three-way uh, split of uh, of responsibility. Sometimes it's only two ways in that the step at the loading dock with the blind copy is omitted, but uh, in any case the person that orders should never be able to pay and the person who pays should never be able to order. That's what access to assets is all about and that's what segregation of duties is all about. So we have some uh, case some let me see do we have a uh, uh, question about this we don't but that's okay uh, sometimes I use uh, questions on this in my polling questions but not in this particular case so that's all you really need to know about uh, internal control that's it. Uh, the, the magic words are uh, accounting controls, transaction controls, and then the four things particularly under transaction controls that we just talked about, namely authorization, recording, access to assets, or as it is sometimes also called segregation of duties, and then the fact that you sometimes periodically compare what uh, uh, your records to the what's physically actually there so though that's an internal control okay I just mentioned that in healthcare internal control immediately segues into compliance so what is compliance here's a Webster's definition on the on the right which defines compliance using the word comply which uh, to me seems a little bit circular. You have to know what comply means in order to understand compliance. So I really like this second definition better. It's conformity in fulfilling official requirements. It's conforming to something, a law, a regulation, a requirement. Um, try some time on your own. Ask a friend to define compliance and see what answer you get. It's one of those things where it's nice to step back once in a while and look at a def an actual definition of it. So that's essentially what compliance is. Uh, very simple at this point. So what is it that we have to comply with in healthcare? A whole bunch of things. Um, and uh, in some cases these are things that require us to spend money and uh, they're called unfunded mandates. We talked a little bit about that in our second webinar in our capital uh, project analysis. In, in, in some cases they are, uh, they don't require capital necessarily, but they require lots and lots of labor in order to comply with. So the main things, and the list is long, the main things that we comply with are listed here. It's, uh, it's Title 18 and Title 19, which is uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, there's also a Title 5, which is uh, an older act uh, uh, that goes back to the original Social Security Act from 1935. Uh, when it says 1965 here, that, that is the date these two titles were added, which is Medicare and Medicaid. The Social Security Act itself is 30 years older than that. This Title V uh, was already added in the 1930s, and it was the first time that uh, the federal government got into health care in a very, very small way. It still appears on the cost report as a column, this Title V, but it is essentially a very, very insignificant part uh, of, of what the government today uh, is on the hook for, for health care, which is Title 18 and Title 19. Okay, then there's ERISA, HIPAA, HITECH, EMTALA, just a whole list, and it, the list continues, Sarbanes, Oxley, Stark, anti-kickback, then there is uh, uh, tax reporting, uh, Form 990, which we'll talk about a little bit. There's the Medicare cost report, and then there are the newest set of compliance regulations that uh, are in, included in the Accountable Care Act. 
So let's take uh, each of these in, in, in more detail and uh, I'm going to take us here in this particular case to the uh, pre-read section. Okay, and uh, here you can see what it is uh, in more detail. I am on page, uh, what page I am I on here? Page 129 in your book. I'm going to make this bigger. Makes sense, you can see it more. Okay, so the False Claims Act is uh, the granddaddy of uh, the compliance acts that uh, we in healthcare have to comply with. Look how old it is. It was 100 uh, years, 150 years old last year. It's as old as the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, which was also 150 years ago last year. It's a civil war law that uh, uh, protects the government as purchaser of goods and services from uh, fraudulent goods or non-compliant goods. In the Civil War, when this uh, Congress enacted this law, the, the issue was that uh, 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 people were selling the government things that were of inferior quality and, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what it was, rations, uh, uh, cannonballs, horses, I don't know, uh, but it, it, uh, it's a law that has been amended and changed many times and is still in effect today and is perhaps one of the uh, uh, biggest weapons uh, the federal government has to enforce compliance in healthcare. Together with it comes a whistleblower provision that uh, rewards uh, someone who comes forward and uh, fingers uh, uh, malfeasance in, in organizations with uh, 15 to 25 or maybe even 30 percent of the proceeds that the government collects. Uh, so what happens is the whistleblower uh, sues the, um, the organization but the suit is essentially taken up by the uh, Department of Justice which uh, which initiates and persecutes the case and then uh, the whistleblower uh, uh, gets a portion of the proceeds. Uh, the Social Security Act we already talked about uh, these different titles um, and let's talk about ERISA next. It's a law that is 40 years old this year it just had its anniversary this summer. It uh, uh, was something passed um, very soon after President Nixon's resignation in 1974, I think that fall. It's the Employee Retirement Income and Security Act which sets minimum minimum standards for pension plans because there was a lot of fraud in in uh, particular union pension funds, but also where uh, uh, employers uh, uh, defrauded uh, uh, employees out of uh, out of funds, uh, and uh, the ERISA law fixed that. Uh, how is it important to us in healthcare in that it applies to self-insured healthcare? Uh, plans, which most uh, uh, healthcare plans uh, offered through the workplace are, uh, where uh, organizations self-insure and they have Blue Cross or someone else pay their claims, but the money comes out of their own pockets. So how, what does ERISA have to say about those kinds of plans? It essentially uh, exempts those plans from state mandated uh, insurance benefits. In uh, health insurance is regulated at the state level. Uh, except for these ERISA plans, these employer-sponsored healthcare plans, of which there are a lot. You see the numbers here, uh, how many Americans have those kinds of plans. So that's the only thing you really need to know about ERISA. You don't need to know about the uh, pension uh, regulations uh, associated with ERISA. Uh, COBRA is another one that we have to comply with simply as employers. We have to comply with COBRA. And you, I'm sure, know what 
Cobra is. Here's just a description of some of its provisions. And TALA is one that's more significant for us in healthcare. It's the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. It uh, entitles uh, someone with an emergent condition, someone hurt or someone uh, uh, in, uh, in, in whose health and life are in danger, in danger to receive uh, medical treatment. That's the first part of the, the title, EMT, and the ALA part, the Act of Labor Act, refers to women in labor who have the same right, and that is to deliver their baby in an emergency room uh, and, and cannot be turned away and sent back out into the street or shipped off to another hospital. Now, EMTALA has, uh, 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 has a lot of specifics relating to at what point in the process of a patient being treated or seen in the emergency room can someone ask for information on the patient. So if you walk into an ER, What's the first thing that happens? There's a person there with the, at the desk with a clipboard, and uh, after saying hello, they say, oh, oh, please write your name here and uh, your date of birth, and uh, you know, show me some ID so I know that it's really you, and then have a seat, please. And uh, then a nurse comes out. Uh, this is desk two, so to speak, and says. Uh, you know, why are you here? What's what's the nature of your complaint? And the nurse triages the patient and determines whether the patient gets to uh, the privilege of waiting in the ER for a while uh, and watching television, or whether the patient gets taken back into a, uh, into an emergency uh, room right away. That is known as triage, uh, where you segregate, the, separate the uh, emergent cases from the non-emergent cases. And the question is, at what point can you ask for uh, insurance information? And the answer is, uh, you can ask, and, and this is, I think, very beautifully described here in this section in the book, uh, which essentially says that uh, you can uh, ask for uh, insurance information, including insurance uh, coverage, you can ask that once the patient has been screened, um, uh, once the patient has been screened, and once the patient has been stabilized, you can actually also ask for money. Okay, that's the, the dividing line here. So stabilized frequently also means treated because uh, frequently you can't really make that uh, distinction between stabilizing and treating. But at that point, once the patient is stabilized and or treated, uh, it is okay to ask for money. Uh, but you can already have uh, got gathered their insurance information after they have been triaged uh, if the patient uh, uh, is in a position to be asked those kinds of questions, okay? Uh, the, the, this description here comes out of uh, uh, something HFMA has put together last year, Patient Financial Communications Best Practices. You can find it on the HFMA website. I'm simply ex excerpting a part of it here. Uh, so you can have a financial discussion is different from a registration. That's essentially what this, what I'm trying to say here. So uh, a financial discussion has to do about money, whereas registration has to do about uh, gathering a name, address, uh, including insurance information. That is okay to gather beforehand. Uh, it's just that you can't ask for money until afterwards. Any questions about that? Okay, if there are none, then we will continue in talking about a couple of other laws here, namely anti-kickback and Stark, uh, two topics that are guaranteed to show up on the exam. So let's talk about what they are. Anti-kickback refers to receiving remuneration in cash or kind for inducing or rewarding referrals of any items or services. 
Example, hospital cannot reward physicians for the surgeries they perform at a hospital. It would be wonderful if a hospital could do that and simply say, doctors, so-and-so, you are so wonderful. Uh, uh, we, we, you know, you keep our emergency room busy and uh, uh, we, lo we just love you and therefore we want to uh, reward you and uh, pay you adequately. You can't do that um, because that violates the anti-kickback statute. So if uh, a doctor comes to the administrator and says, uh, you, you know, I am uh, I walk on water, I, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, get, uh, uh, you, I want you to show that to me in, 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 in terms of what you pay me or what I get, the hospital administrator has to walk away from that conversation, can't have it. Same as a similar situation, the doctor comes to the administrator and says, I want to become your employee, I'm sick and tired of practicing medicine on my own and, and look how profitable I am for you, again, I'm the surgeon that keeps your uh, uh, OR, uh, hopping and busy and so pay me accordingly and the the uh, administrator has to say well we can talk about uh, you becoming an employee but uh, the what we pay you is going to be based on fair market value as determined uh, uh, in a uh, arm's length transaction in other words if you are uh, if you produce you know at the 90th percentile of in work RVUs and this takes us back to last week's topic talking about the Medicare physician fee schedule, yes, then we will de develop a compensation structure that rewards you accordingly of, by your production, but it's going to be by your production, not by how much money the hospital makes uh, uh, on its side from your surgeries. So that's the anti-kickback statute. See, it's been around for a while. And now let's talk about what Stark is. Uh, I'm showing you that there are two pieces of it here. The original uh, part in 1989, uh, 25 years ago, by Pete Stark, who has since retired from Congress. He was a congressman from California, prohibited physician self-referrals for lab services only. So if the, ho if the doctor owned a piece of a, uh, a, a, a lab uh, in town, and wrote uh, prescriptions for lab tests uh, that was considered a, a self-referral uh, to uh, the physician's own business and that was prohibited by Stark 1. It did not and does not prohibit a doctor from operating a small lab in the doctor's office for simple blood work, uh, etc that are part, an integral part of providing uh, healthcare services in the office. We're talking about arrangements with uh, labs, uh, uh, bigger labs, not, not a small lab in the doctor's office. Start two, four years later, extended these uh, self-referral prohibitions to other, um, uh, virtually other, all other uh, entities to which a doctor could possibly refer uh, and uh, for instance an imaging facility if a doctor owns an MRI even in the office even in the office or a surgery center downstairs uh, the doctor cannot self-refer to his or her own MRI or the surgery center downstairs if the doctor has a financial interest in that surgery center. So in uh, reality, how does that work? It means that if uh, I'm a sports medicine physician and I wrote this prescription to for you uh, to have your knee looked at, let's do an MRI on your knee, uh, Brad, uh, I think uh, we need to make sure that your knee is fine, then I can give you a list of uh, MRIs uh, in the community, I can also tell you on that list, I can show you my own MRI down the hall, uh, but I cannot uh, uh, send you down the hall without in, in give, making you uh, make the choice, giving you the choice of where you go. So that's how Stark works. Um, and uh, let us uh, in a moment move on to some 
questions where we're going to test that with polling questions. Then HIPAA, what's HIPAA? Well, hey, Christoph, before yes, we move Brad. on from before we move on from Stark, uh, Charles had a question, and he wanted to okay. know how is it that many hospitals have gain sharing arrangements um, with the anti-kickback laws that are in place. Okay, uh, good question, Charles. Uh, uh, all I can say is that Stark has a bazillion exceptions to it. I mean, lots and lots of exceptions to it and, and uh, gain sharing arrangements if they are properly structured uh, don't violate the anti-kickback statute or the Stark laws, okay? Uh, and uh, But if they do, then you can have the Department of Justice on your heels and uh, get yourself into a, a heck of a lot of trouble. So a gain-sharing arrangement would be structured in a way that uh, would have to be structured in a way that doesn't violate these two laws. Okay, and and someone, yeah, maybe someone else has a, a, a better take on that than I do. Well, we had we had another question come in as, as you were talking about that, and Susan wanted to know if we could discuss um, safe harbors as they relate to Stark. Oh boy, uh, I don't have anything prepared on safe harbors, and uh, I can only tell you that that was a big, big topic. Uh, when Stark first came out, and uh, uh, I remember many an HFMA meeting where, where this was talked about, and all I can say is, uh, if you want to know, uh, uh, Google it and look it up, but for the exam, you don't need to know it. Okay, and uh, you know, I'm going to write myself a note to put something about safe harbors into the text next time. I will have to go back myself and read up on that. Any, sorry, I'm punting on that why I realize that I am, but uh, it's not going to be on the exam. Oh, that's good to know. Yes. Okay, HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act, is really every, on, the only thing that came out of Hillary Care uh, 20 years ago. Uh, the only thing uh, that really made it into law in, in that attempt to reform health care. And so there are certain portability uh, um, uh, provisions that uh, uh, came with, with uh, HIPAA. Essentially it meant that if, uh, and, and, and what HIPAA did is it amended COBRA, okay? Here, this COBRA law, which is an older law. Okay, so you have under COBRA the ability to carry insurance forward. Uh, if you lose your job, you can pay for it yourself for uh, up to 18 months after a qualifying event. So that's a very, very limited form of, uh, of portability, really very, very limited. It also means though that, uh, and this is an amendment to COBRA, that uh, if you uh, if your prior insurance uh, covered something and didn't exclude coverage for it uh, as a pre-existing condition, then your next insurance can't do that either. Okay, so pre-existing conditions that uh, cannot be introduced uh, uh, by a second insurance if they were not an issue with the prior, prior insurance. So th those are the only portability uh, um, provisions that we're really talking about under the P under HIPAA. Now the things that you are more familiar with in HIPAA are the uh, security and privacy uh, rules that came 10, 11 years ago in 2003, and then also the, uh, uh, the electronic standards that uh, uh, go under the title of administrative simplification. And the, those are the 837, the claim form, the remittance, the 835, uh, eligibility and benefit inquiries. These all have different names, claim status requests and notifications, uh, et cetera. So those are uh, 
standards that apply only to uh, covered entities. So covered entities is an important uh, uh, term here. They don't apply to organizations that are not covered entities. So what are covered entities? I'm going to show you and uh, give you an opportunity to answer that a minute in a minute in a polling question. I'm not going to tell you what a covered entity is. Well, actually, I'm telling you here what it is. In my own text, I'm also telling you what not covered entities are. So let's look at this briefly here. It'll help with the polling questions in a minute. So uh, accident uh, uh, policies, disability policies, auto insurance, general liability, and workers' comp are not covered entities under HIPAA. Um, also not covered entities are organizations that don't submit claims in an electronic format. Okay, They are not uh, covered entities, but most organizations will be covered entities with these exceptions. Now one thing I want to add here, and that is that uh, business associate agreements are also part of HIPAA. This is not in your book. This is something I just thought about adding uh, very recently after putting the book together, uh, after someone told me that there were some questions about business associate agreements on the exam. So I'm going to email this section to Brad on BAAs and uh, uh, allow you to add that to your material. It's essentially an agreement that um, an organization makes with uh, people that are not employees uh, but business associates, i.e. contractors or subcontractors, and it uh, binds them to protect the health information uh, that they have access to in, in working for the organization. And there are specific rules that pertain to business associates business associates, they're spelled out here, there's 10 of them. Um, for instance, uh, that I'll give you an example of one that uh, uh, essentially if uh, there is a, if, if you lose your computer, if your computer uh, uh, get stolen as a contractor, you have to report that to the client, okay, and uh, take measures to uh, ensure that that information does not uh, uh, get out. That has, in other words, you have to have encryption, you have to have certain ways of protecting that information. That's one of the requirements of a business associate agreement. Okay, so there's 10 rules pertaining to that. I'll send those to you so you have those. Oh, what am I doing here? Christoph, before we move yes. on from um, BAAs, Beverly asks, um, as a contractor, how does a BAA differ from a non-disclosure agreement? Okay, a non-disclosure agreement, that's a good question, Beverly. Um, a non-disclosure agreement would be something that uh, a company would sign, let's say, okay, let, I'll give you an example. Let's say vendor, uh, a vendor comes to you and says, I have this uh, fabulous uh, solution for you. It has a wonderful ROI uh, and uh, I, I would love to tell you more about it. At some point, the vendor is going to be in a situation where they are going to be disclosing trade secrets, potentially trade secrets or business secrets to the potential client. And um, the uh, vendor can protect themselves against disclosure of those trade secrets to outsiders, to third parties, by having the, uh, the uh, organization, the healthcare organization, sign a non-disclosure agreement. Okay. So even if uh, no contract results and the uh, the hospital walks away from from the vendor and this opportunity, the the hospital is bound to not disclose the things they learned uh, in in evaluating the vendor's proposal. That's a non-disclosure agreement. 
It's different from a business associate agreement. Business associate agreement pertains to organizations that actually have a contract with each other and are doing business together. And it relates specifically to HIPAA protected uh, uh, private uh, uh, and protected healthcare information. So that's the difference. Good, very good question. And you know, I should put something about non-disclosure agreements in to, into the contract section of the book because that's where that would go. So thank you for your question. Okay, so that's what else do we supply uh, comply with here? A couple other cases: Sarbanes Oxley, High Tech. You know that, uh, uh, and then some other things, including certificate of need. Uh, laws that try to restrain the proliferation of, uh, of uh, construction and healthcare. Okay, and then there are some state and uh, other regulations uh, and federal regulations. There is uh, Internal Revenue Code and then there are uh, uh, some other things like CHAMPUS and TRICARE that we also have to comply with and the CHIP program. All of that is described to you at he for you here. And the, just the last comment, the difference between fraud and abuse, something that you could also encounter on the exam. Fraud is always intentional, carries criminal penalties. Abuse is generally uh, unintentional and uh, carries civil monetary uh, penalties. It also has a lower burden of proof than a fraud does. Okay, so this Take a look at this box, it's on page 131. Okay, it's time for some polling questions. So Brad, take us please to uh, the first polling question, polling question number one. All right, and so title, oh gosh, you're testing my Roman numerals, title 18 of the Social Security Act refers to which of the following? And just a reminder, everybody, if you do need CPE credits, uh, please make sure you respond to the polling questions. Um, even if you don't know the answer, we just need a way to know that you are actually paying attention and not taking a nap. Yes. So, Christoph, while you're, when you were talking earlier about the uh, – the Stark and the anti-kickback stuff, and um, yes. you know, physicians having labs in their own uh, offices. Yes. Since I work in a lab, it reminded yes. me of an issue that we've been having. We have here, or in the state of Tennessee, with our version of Medicaid, in that TenCare has now mandated that we send everything if we want to get paid to, and I forget if it's either Quest or LabCorp, but one of the big lab companies, and they won't really? pay if we, uh, they won't pay when we do it in-house, but. We still do it in-house because it's way more convenient for our patients and our providers. But Yes, interesting. Well, you can understand why, uh, why uh, the big uh, lab companies take an issue with this because they, they uh, take these uh, laws very seriously and they want it to be arm's length. But that takes a little bit too far, I think. All right. It means that you eat it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like I said, that's something, you know, we just get denied on everything, so it really skews our denials numbers. Yes, so. oh, that's too bad. <laughs> too bad. All yeah. right, so we have got the results in, and 88% um, selected the first choice, health insurance for the aged and disabled. Yes, very good. Okay, let's go to the next question. It's on the anti-kickback statute. All right. Under the anti-kickback statute, you got a whole bunch of choices here for everybody to pick from. So we'll give you guys a minute to go ahead and lock in your answers. And... I'll give another 30 seconds, but they are coming in fast and furious, Christoph, and we have Wonderful. got about 70% of the folks have picked E, all of the above. Yes, and that is correct. Very good. And uh, uh, Beverly, I, I think maybe you were the one asking about safe harbors. So notice that uh, medical directorships and startup guarantees are allowed. Um, 
as long as uh, they um, are at arm's length and uh, and the price tags attached to them or the remuneration attached to them, the terms are reasonable and uh, don't play favorites. So uh, all of the above is the right answer. Let's go to number three. Let's keep going. Question number three. All right, under Mtala, providers are permitted to do which of the following? So we'll leave it open for another 30 seconds or so. We've yes. got about 75% of the folks have voted, and it is actually a pretty close one. Yes, and it should be a, a pretty close one. I'll tell you in a minute All right. why. Just another few seconds. So if you haven't put in an answer yet, go ahead and stick one in so we, we know you're still with us. All right, well, let's take a look at these results. Uh, B and D are both correct. Uh, this is uh, not like what a uh, question like you would see on the exam, okay, where more than one, if more than one answer is correct on an exam question, that exam question is a bad question. Uh, payment, as for payment after patients have been stabilized, that's how I would, D is how I would have answered the question, which I see uh, most people did, but actually, and this is what I was trying to convey earlier, it is it is also okay, and this is something that's frequently misunderstood, is that you can collect insurance information after the patient has been triaged, okay? So uh, that is also correct, but uh, you know, the, the technically correct answer, the safe answer is D, but B is also correct. Okay, let us do one more polling question and then we are going to uh, move on to uh, uh, some more compliance topics. Next question, please. All right. So in 1996, HIPAA did which of the following? Read, it, read the answers very yeah. carefully, please. No, oh, you don't need to read oh, them, okay. uh, Brad. Yeah, I'm I'll probably I'll probably audience. mess them up if I read them out loud, <laughs> folks. I'll I'll be more confused because I'll the dyslexia will kick in. Sure. <laughs> so another thirty seconds on that one, folks, and just just a reminder in case I forget to say it at the end. Just remember, we're going to have a break for about three weeks, and we're going to come back on November 4th um, with a final webinar to kind of review and recap everything we've gone over. Yes. So mm -hmm. so take advantage of those few weeks um, and study up so that way you can come back and have have questions ready for, for areas you know that you might not have, have, have grasped the first time. And also go ahead and get yourself scheduled to uh, take the exam before we get into the the holiday and depending on your facility budget season. Yes, they're, they're rolling our budgets out this year earlier than ever. So okay. <laughs> All right, we have got ninety four percent of the folks have voted, so we're going to close the poll. And seventy percent of the folks picked the first option. And that is correct, yes. Uh, and B is not correct because uh, you there are no electronic standards that govern cash payments between payers and providers, okay? Uh, electronic cash payments are basically electronic funds transfers, EFP, uh, EFTs. Those are not governed by HIPAA, they're governed by the American Bankers Association rules, and then maybe there is a federal standard on that as well. HIPAA does regulate remittance advices, but remittance advices are not electronic cash payments. So there's a, a trick built into B here, um, uh, although I know most of you got it right by saying 
A is the right answer. Okay, so where are we now? Hey, Christoph, we have, before we yes. go forward, uh, Deborah had a question um, about one of the polling questions, and she asks, since Imtala is an issue, wouldn't it be safer for B, choice B in that one, um, instead of payment, um, to look at the payment at discharge to ensure compliance with Imtala? Yes. Um, yes, it is uh, safer, but uh, the, the point is that I think, and, and I'm speaking here as a, uh, uh, all you're getting is my five cents worth of my opinion. I think organizations play too safe when it comes to, to Mtala. They, uh, they easily buckle into the clinical folks' uh, uh, discomfort about anything having to do with money in the ER. Okay, so they uh, uh, don't represent, I think, finances legitimate interest in gathering insurance information early on and uh, uh, particularly if someone is not emergent I mean if they're you know in in a bad shape uh, uh, in been in an auto wreck or what uh, you, you're not going to do any of this anyhow but insofar as it is possible to do so in a nice way you can ask uh, people for insurance information after they have been triaged and, and that's something that I don't think enough organizations have the courage to do. Okay, so where are we now in our topic, in our overall schema of things? We have gone through a lot of this compliance stuff. Okay, the two big ones that are left are um, uh, the 990 and the Medicare cost report. So we're going to spend some time talking about those. But before we get there, we need to spend a little bit of time on on some of the tools that uh, the government uses to ensure compliance. Remember from this one slide that I showed you that Medicare is like a gusher that uh, uh, this image here. Medicare is an ocean of money surrounded by people who want some. I, I love that uh, uh, quote from an editorial from the Wall Street Journal. So Medicare uh, doesn't have a lot of fences around it. Uh, if you send a claim that had, checks all the right boxes, you get paid whether you are uh, uh, defrauding the government or not. So compliance is hugely important. Other payers uh, and the commercial payers surround themselves by, by much more by walls in, in, in the sense that they require pre-certifications, pre-notifications, pre-authorizations. Medicare doesn't require those. That's why this all matters. So what are the type of fences, what types of fences does, uh, the, uh, does the government have or build around its system? And some of those are described here in this book um, by talking about claim edit tools and review programs as the outpatient code editor. It's again one of those things that uh, uh, a few people can really truly define and describe because it is a mystery to them exactly what it is. So here is what an outpatient code editor does. Okay, it uh, edits the claim for accuracy, it assigns APCs, it assigns status indicators, payment indicators, it computes discounts. You see all of this is OPPS stuff. That's what the outpatient payment uh, coding editor does. It edits a claim before it pays it. Okay, so it does all of that and then it pays the claim. Then it pays the claim. Uh, determines payment adjustment as if possible. On the inpatient side, on the inpatient side, some of this works a little bit differently. Uh, on the inpatient side, you have uh, a, uh, a, uh, uh, comp oh, uh, a 
pricer and a, whew, what's the other one? Someone help me out, a pricer and a grouper. Okay, a grouper and a pricer. A grouper uh, separates what an OCE does on the outpatient side into two different components. The grouper does all of the grouping stuff uh, namely, it determines what the uh, uh, DRG is based on the principal diagnosis and the principal procedure, and then the secondary and uh, secondary diagnoses and procedure codes. It groups, it determines what uh, the DRG is, and then the pricer, the pricer attaches a dollar sign to it. Okay, and it attaches a dollar sign to it, like we saw last week, that depends on your uh, hospitals or your facilities uh, wage index and uh, your construction, your hard hat index and all of that. That's what the pricer does. On the outpatient side, in the OPPS world, the OCE does both of those things together. It's one set of edits that does both. That's what an OCE is an OCE edit is one that basically converts the raw data from a UB04 claim into a payment using all of the things that we talked about last week in terms of packaging and uh, lining out the things that don't get paid because they're, uh, they're non-payable line items like uh, uh, recovery room and anesthesia and so forth and it determines the APC groups something the codes into an APC so that's what the OCE does and then the NCCI is a whole nother set of edits that uh, look at um, pairs you know we talked about medical necessity uh, last time and how on the outpatient side it's really code pairs that get get edited. It's the, it's the presence of this CPT code with that ICD-9 or ICD-10 code that either makes sense or doesn't make sense. That's what the NCCI or CCI edits do. And uh, you notice there are lots and lots of those edits. Some of them are even secret. They're not even published. Uh, it's like the IRS doesn't publish the algorithms they use to select uh, uh, tax returns for audit. Similarly, CMS does not publish all of its CCI edits either. Okay, so there is an example here how these edits work, these CCI edits work. And they're also sometimes called column one, column two edits. And uh, so um, it essentially means this thing can or cannot go with this other thing. Okay, that's what these edits do. Then there are also medically unlikely edits that uh, uh, define or uh, identify items that just don't make sense, uh, uh, where particularly the units of service are seem to be wrong. It it weeds those edits out and uh, also edits for those. And here are uh, some of them. For instance, a level one, two, three, four, or five edit, uh, MUE edit would say, well, for a given date of service, you should only have one of these. Okay, you're not going to have two emergency visits on the same day. If there were, you would need to have a modifier that uh, is appended to either the first or the second visit, doesn't matter which one, but identifies that the patient came back for a second emergency and that it is fair and correct to be billing a second emergency visit on a given date. And then there are a whole bunch of review programs uh, uh, that uh, you need to be aware of. Of course, you know what racks are. Here they are, uh, but uh, you might not know about the CERT program or the QIAO program, and so they're just described for you here, so you have an idea what they are, what a ZIPIC is, and a PSC, and a MEDIC is, and then what does the OIG do, and then etc. And then here is a, a, a scary statistic that shows uh, the Medicare ocean surrounded by people want some and notice what these error rates are that uh, uh, 
actually get uh, computed and, and that, that's why as taxpayers we all are very much in favor of compliance. Okay, so with all of that out of the way we can now concentrate on two more topics. One is the cost report. So let's do the cost report next. Uh, uh, the best way to answer the questions on the exam about the cost report is to know what a cost report is and what it looks like. Okay, and uh, the best way to do that is to go to page, sorry. Hey Christoph, yeah, go before ahead. we move on to the cost report, um, yes. D Daniel's got an interesting question, one I certainly couldn't answer myself. He asks, when a provider's claim is consistently audited before getting paid by Medicare, for more than four months, what could be the reason for this? What could they be looking for? Oh my goodness. Well, uh, for one thing, uh, we know that the OIG, I didn't talk about this, the OIG publishes a, a, a work plan. Here's the OIG. This is a page that, this is the very last thing on that prior list of organizations. They do publish a work plan of the things that they particularly want to look at. Uh, and um, it could be medical necessity. Let's just uh, use that as an example. Uh, and uh, so they, you know, they're entitled to this. I, I don't know. Maybe someone else wants to uh, uh, give a better answer than I can. You know, there must, there maybe is a pattern there uh, in your data that that uh, they're interested in. I'm just going to punt on that one and see what someone else says. But the OIG um, does uh, want to know certain things, and these work plans change, and uh, they make wonderful topics for HFMA meetings for someone to talk about what the OIG has in mind this next year to look at. Let's go on then. If if uh, and I'm not sure I really yeah. answered your question. No. Very well, let's. Well. If anybody's got any ideas for Daniel, go ahead and post it down in the public chat so that way everybody oh, can yes, see it. Please. And then let me know what uh, what the answer is. So what is a cost report? A cost report is uh, a document that very few people who work in healthcare finance outside of uh, the, those who work in reimbursement or who are controllers and CFOs ever lay their hands on auditors, of course, see them also, uh, public auditors and then Medicare auditors deal with them as well. Cost report is essentially a cost accounting system that uh, takes apart your data and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, uses it to determine what uh, Medicare pays for and doesn't pay for. Now, most of the things that uh, Medicare pays for aren't really uh, dependent so much on the cost report anymore. I mean, you're, uh, you saw last week in the uh, diagram when we talked about IPPS, for instance, that there are rules that start, you know, with a single dollar amount, and then by applying all of these uh, geographic adjusters to it, de determine what your payment is going to be for a certain uh, a, 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 a DRG, MSDRG. But there are certain things that uh, are still up for grabs, and. Uh, one of them is, and there are several of them are described here for you. Disproportionate share is one. Uh, graduate med medical education is another. Indirect med medical education is a third. And then a fourth one is bad debt. Um, uh, Medicare pays for the bad debts of its beneficiaries, period. So if, uh, if a Medicare beneficiary stiffs the hospital and doesn't pay their inpatient deductible or their outpatient co-insurance, uh, co uh, then, and you have gone through the same follow-up and collection process, procedures and processes as you normally would with any other patient, then Medicare will pay you 
uh, I think it's 70% or 65%, I think 65% or two-thirds of that bad, bad debt, Medicare will pay you. The assumption, I guess, is that the other 35% maybe is charity care that fell through the cracks and, and you simply treated it as bad debt. So that's why they no longer pay 100% of bad debt. But uh, that is something that, uh, that reimbursement depends on the data that you submit in a bad, in a uh, Medicare cost report in terms of, a, in, in the form of a schedule that shows uh, what all your, that lists the patients the dates of service and the amounts that you were not able to collect and uh, you then get reimbursed for. So that is, these are still some uses for the cost report when it comes to actually determining what you as a specific hospital uh, get paid. Uh, so a cost report in that sense in terms of what the settlement is in that regard is not as uh, prominent anymore as it once was, but it is a, it's a cost reporting system that uh, is uh, used to report your costs and not just your financial results. Although a cost report does contain a balance sheet, a statement of changes in uh, financial position, it contains an income statement, has it has very much the look and feel also of a financial statement. It is essentially a cost accounting tool. Now where this really matters is for critical access hospitals, which are paid on a cost basis. For them, the cost report, and it's the same cost report in terms of its schedules and forms as a acute care hospital uh, uh, files, uh, a cost report is extremely important for setting the reimbursement. So it's that's essentially what it is. You, you can read more about it here. I will sp spare you all of those details here. So let's spend a little bit of time at looking at a cost report itself because I think uh, most of us have not seen what these things look like and uh, for purposes of the exam you really need to have a good grasp of even just what a cost report looks like. You don't have to remember what the schedules are called, but uh, uh, just know, you know, you understand the, the use of something when you, when, you, uh, uh, when you dig a little deeper and actually look at the pages themselves. So the top sheet of it, the, the main and the most important page is this one. It's the top sheet that has the attestation signature of the uh, uh, person signing for the provider on it. And then it has columns here on the bottom uh, for the different uh, uh, social security programs that we're concerned with. Title 5, Title 18, which is Medicare A and B, Title 19, which is Medicaid, and then it has uh, uh, the uh, uh, a new column which is uh, in a different shade and color here for meaningful use. This was added in 2009 in, in the one of the first things that President Obama did is sign a law that uh, uh, encouraged hospitals to uh, put their medical records uh, online and uh, so a column was added for HIT for that law. So the most important line on this uh, bottom half on this settlement summary, part three, is this last line 200. And particularly, yeah, it's that last line because every single one of these programs has at the end of it either a do to or do from CMS line. So either you owe money to, the, or, uh, to CMS or CMS owes you money. Looking now at the, back to our very first webinar and going to remember the page 143. I'm going to go back to the financial statements at the beginning and uh, look here at the liabilities. Notice that HFMA Health System had a line here called payable to contractual agencies of 71 million dollars and 67 million the year before. That could also have been a receivable on the current 
asset side could have shown up here someplace, but it turns out to have been a payable. So what's the relationship of this number right here to the number in the, on the cost report itself, the do to and do from? The, uh, an organization is going to basically create a shadow cost report on an ongoing basis before even filing its annual cost report five months after the end of the fiscal year with uh, CMS, it's going to have its own cost report already kind of figured out, and it know it will. It's it's going to know whether it owes money back to CMS or is going to get money from CMS. So that's the number that goes on the balance sheet. Also, if old cost reports will be reopened because the hospital has discovered that there's something, they, some money they left on the table, that would also show in the financial statements and be estimated. So uh, this do to, do from number uh, uh, is going to in some way uh, also be reflected in the financial statements. That's essentially what I'm I'm trying to say so these are very this is a very important line item because this determines if you get money back it's like on your taxes or you owe money to CMS from your last years of year of operation okay so behind that title page uh, uh, comes a page that basically identifies who you are your name and your address okay it's kind of like a tax return in that regard where do you live What's your PO box? What's your provider number? From when to when is this? And then uh, what are the specific provider numbers of all of your components? And then here is the CBSA number, which we encountered last week when we talked about how Medicare payments are calculated. Remember, we came into this geographic adjustment factor. You list it here from a published table, then you list what they what type of provider you are and what date you were certified. Basically, it's a demographic page and uh, uh, where you identify yourself to uh, CMS. And then you also, on the next page, uh, tell them how busy you were. You uh, say how big you are, how many beds are licensed, how many be beds are staffed, uh, and then how many inpatient days or outpatient visits you had. Uh, in each of these facilities, and then how many FTEs you had. You report a lot of data and discharges here at the very end. So this is a lot of numbers on this next page. Then in Worksheet B, this is the most important or the, the core, or the heart of a cost report, in my opinion. This is a step-down calculation, and I'm going to show you how this works in a simplified example. Christoph, before you move on to the uh, example, uh, we've got a question, and they're asking, um, does the do to do from hit the P&L or the balance sheet? Oh boy, it's also going to hit the uh, P&L. Uh, because it's going to be a payable, and... Uh, you would have to accrue for it. In other words, whenever you accrue for something, you're going to also hit the uh, the, the the income statement. Where on the income statement it is, let's take a look. Because I don't know, I've never looked for it. Let's see if we can figure it out. Here's the statement of operations. You know, I don't know where this would sit here. Does I? My guess is it's going to be uh, built into the uh, net patient service revenue. It would be accrued for on the revenue side. Okay. In other words, it would be buried in the net revenue calculation itself. Okay, that's where it's going to show rather than as an operating expense. If someone else feels otherwise, please uh, speak up. So, so Mark chimed in. I think he's he's probably a little bit more expert. I know cost reports than I am. He said, due to due from would flow through contractual allowances. Yes. Um, to have an impact on net revenue. Um, 
and Bill says typically it is NPSR other than a line item. I'm sorry, say that again. The very uh, he, said, he said typically it is NPSR other than a line item. Not patient service revenue. Okay, okay, so it. Uh... Okay, so maybe what he is saying is that it would be, it would be in other revenue. That, that, I, that, I don't know. I'm, that's what I'm guessing. Is that maybe you yeah. can clarify that through the chat a little bit further? It is really related to patient service revenue. So I would think it would be up here in the in the net patient service revenue, but I'm just not sure. It could also maybe be down here. Okay, let's see what... Uh, oh, hold on, we got another say. one. Um, B Bill followed up and he said this is like a separate line item on the income statement. Uh, it is built okay. into net patient service revenue, as you have described, okay. Christoph. All right, so so it would be, you know, if it were a significant item, it, it might be broken out of this number. There might be a separate line item here, okay, that, that, that said a, a contractual settlement or whatever. Adjustment to... Uh, contractual adjustments okay well that's helpful thank you very much okay going back to the cost report here uh, all right so here so what I was going to say is that the heart of a cost report is this worksheet B which is a step-down allocation and this is uh, something worth looking at a little bit more in detail so I'm going to make this as big as I can uh, but first of all I wanted to show you if you look at this whole schedule and in most uh, cost report software systems this takes more than one page so I'm trying to show it to you here on a single page and it's hard enough to do given how many columns there are I'm going to make this as big as I possibly can so here's a hospital that has uh, expenses of uh, 46.6 million dollars this red number down here okay that's the total number of expenses uh, that these expenses are um, created or generated by a number of uh, cost centers first of all by general cost service centers these listed up above here okay they're in yellow I've given you a subtotal of them here over on the left there's none actually on the schedule I just created one over here so out of the 46 million dollars of total expenses almost half is overhead because these are all overhead departments okay well the first one isn't really overhead it's new capital it's 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 the new bricks and mortars and machinery you put into into uh, into effect but the other things here from line four on down are really overhead items employee benefits is an overhead item all of administration is overhead maintenance and repairs plant operations housekeeping cafeteria etc those are all overhead departments so this 22 million dollars of overhead needs to be allocated to the uh, revenue producing departments of the hospital which are either inpatient or ancillary or outpatient and then there are also some that are non-reimbursable okay so let's deal with each of them by themselves here's your inpatient this is your inpatient business total expenses uh, six and a half million intensive care inpatient unit nurseries an inpatient unit skilled nursing facilities uh, is a you know a place with beds where people stay overnight so those 22 million in costs in part need to get allocated to these inpatient routine service cost centers they also need to be allocated to these ancillary service centers operating room uh, medical imaging lab you name it all of those and emergency is one of them also well emergency is an outpatient service center here it is costs of three and a half million and then certain things Medicare doesn't allow as uh, as uh, reimbursable like the gift shop the flower shop the foundation so how does this work it's a step-down mechanism that says that the first line item which is uh, 
new capital related costs gets allocated on a basis of square feet first to the other overhead departments depending on their use of square feet and then based on square feet usage to these other departments down below. Okay, so that's to the tune of four and a half million dollars. It's that's four and a half million dollars that showed up up here. That number has now been completely allocated downward to first the other overhead departments and then to the uh, revenue producing departments. And you move along that way, you take this 400,000 and you take the employee benefits of 3.3, you allocate that as well and you get rid of it uh, through this allocation mechanism until at the end it's all gone. You see there's nothing left here in the step down mechanism above and all of the yellow numbers are now uh, a part, they're not included in whatever cost numbers were already there in these revenue producing departments. And once you have done that, you can then line up each of these costs with your charges. This is from a different worksheet. I've just simply laid it side by side here so you can see how this works. You can lay it side by side with charges and divide the one by the other to develop your cost to charge ratio. So what this means out of this unit right here, I have to see which one that is, out of operating room, uh, 14 cents on the dollar are costs and or 15 cents and 85 percent of the dollar of your dollar are contractual adjustments essentially. So, or profit. In other words, your costs in relation to charges in the operating room are one of uh, uh, 15 cents of costs to ev out of every dollar of charges. And you see what these cost to charge ratios are. And these cost to charge ratios are then used to determine how, what the value of your charity care is, what the cost of your charity care was in the last year. And, and you, we'll see that in the footnote in the financial statements. That's how HFMA health system uh, estimates the, the costs associated with its charity care patients by, by these uh, ratios here. They take the charges for the uh, surgery for the uh, uh, charity patients and they convert them to cost with these uh, formulas here. So that's how the cost report works. Okay, so what is it uh, that else is in the cost report? And pay close attention here. Uh, there is um, a complete financial statement. Not that you would expect it to be there, but here it is. It's a different format than uh, your audited financial statements uh, would look like. This is just the government's format that they want every organization filing a cost report to follow. Here are the current assets, the long-term assets. Next page, liabilities. And then your net assets, your capital accounts here, they all are with uh, restricted and unrestricted and temporarily restricted accounts. All of that, which we discussed in webinar number one, shows up here in the cost report. Then there's also statement of changes in fund balances, as I mentioned, and an income statement. Again, it looks a little bit different from an income statement in your financial statements, but it, it is an income statement. All right, it's the whole thing right there. So that's what I wanted to say about uh, the cost report. I think uh, if you look at this uh, section in the study guide, you will uh, be fortified for questions about the cost report on the exam, but you will also have learned something about a cost report in general that I think will stand you in good stead as a financial manager. Here's an example of a PSNR report uh, I'm not going to go into this. Uh, you can read about it. Uh, it's described to you, but uh, I wanted to show you what this, what these reports look like. Here's another example of, an, of a PSNR report. Okay, read about it in the book. Okay, any questions at this point? No, we don't have any other questions. Okay, then let's do some more polling questions and then we'll talk about uh, the 990. Okay, polling question number five. I think that's the next polling question. Yep. So, entities covered under HIPAA include which of the following? 
So remember, folks, if you need CPE, you need to answer your polling questions. Even if you don't know the right answer, just give us an answer. Leave it open for about another 20 seconds. So, so Christoph, this this one, watching the answers come in was interesting because we had one kind of clear winner at the beginning, and then we had another one that kind of caught up to it. Okay. That's fine. All right, so as we can see here, 54% uh, said clearing houses and 40% said paper claims. Yes, the right answer is clearing houses. Uh, uh, provider sets and paper claims are not covered entities. For whatever reason, they're not. Uh, and as you know, uh, generally electronic claims are required. But for instance, if you are a you know, a physical therapist uh, with your own little physical sh therapy shop and you do all of your own billing or you are a clinical social worker and you do your own billing and all of your claims are paper claims, that's all you do, then you are exempt from uh, the transaction standards of HIPAA because you are not a covered entity. Now clearing houses, remember from the conversation last week, are traffic cops that make it easier for payers and providers to communicate with each other. That's all they are. They're basically uh, 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 hubs to which transactions flow in, in both directions. Let's do the next polling question number six. This is a question that you would not see on the exam. This question number six. Because they are not going to want to know what the difference between the two Starks are. That's too far in the past to, to really matter. All right, so here we go. So pretty close one again uh, between A and C. Okay, the right answer is C. Um, let me see, can you see this? Yes, okay. C is the right answer. Um, start one only covered labs and then start two uh, added a lot of other services to it. Let me shut my phone off here. I do that. Okay. Um, uh, a uh, more more people than that answered A though. Stark prohibits self referral. Stark two paying for referrals. Really, what that is is the difference between Stark and uh, the anti kickback. So the reason A is not the right answer is that. Stark prohibits self-referrals, period. That is that is correct, but the second part of it is not correct. Uh, Stark has nothing to do with referrals. Uh, that's the anti-kickback law that uh, doesn't allow you to uh, pay for referrals. So it, you see, while this may be a question that you wouldn't see in this format, it's still a valuable pedagogical tool in that it tells you again to go back and make sure you are able to clearly distinguish in your own mind between the difference of anti-kickback which is referrals and self-referrals which is stark. Next question please Brad, question number seven. 
Okay. Medicare Part A pays for which of the following? And so while everyone's answering that one, um, I want to go ahead and let everybody know that we still have about 10 of the study guides left. So if anybody's got a colleague or a coworker who's thinking about also becoming certified, they can still go ahead and register for the webinars and pay online, and we can go ahead and get that book shipped out to them, and they can watch all of the, uh, the webinars and everything on YouTube still. All right, about another 20 seconds or so, and we'll close this one up. Looks like most people have gone ahead and voted. And we've got a pretty clear winner on this one, I'd say. With about 72% um, selected option A, inpatient facility and physician services. And that is not the right answer. That is not the right answer. Uh, um, and you know what is interesting is that here we work in healthcare, and you would think that we would get uh, something like this right, but we, we don't. Uh, and uh, so what does Medicare A pay for? It pays for inpatient services, inpatient services. Medicare B pays for outpatient and physician services. Now, inpatient claims are on UBs. Uh, outpatient claims sometimes are on UBs, sometimes on 1500 forms, but uh, they're both Medicare B. Hospice services are generally paid for under Medicare A. Okay, we have one more polling question, number eight. Let's do that one uh, and then wrap up uh, by talking about the last things we want to cover. Okay. This is about step down. And so we just talked about this. Go ahead, Brad. Oh, I was just going to say, in in that first choice where it says ancillary plus outpatient uh, cost centers, that should be an ampersand, but the uh, webinar software will not let me enter an ampersand. Oh, so my I goodness. Replace those with pluses, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. What do you allocate to first is really the question. Do you first allocate to other overhead departments, uh, which would be B? Or do you first allocate to revenue producing departments, namely inpatient, ancillary, outpatient? That would be uh, answer A. All right, so, so we've only got about 75% of people voted, so I'll leave it open for about another 10 to 15 seconds. So go ahead and get your responses in. All right, this one was probably our closest one yet. Okay, uh, the diagram I showed you, the step-down diagram, I'll go back to that one more time here. Uh, as, um, essentially, you see you start with, uh, 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 with your allocatable costs right here, this, this yellow section. And as you move to the right, the first thing you do is allocate them to other overhead departments. That's what you do going down. Oops, I can't really do this, really show you where I am right now. You see, you start allocating it first to other overhead departments. And then, and that's simply because it's uh, one is above the other. Then you then uh, uh, also allocate it to the routine and over uh, routine departments. Okay. so. Um, so A is, is uh, so the right answer is uh, is uh, A. You start with uh, no no B. You start with sorry. You first allocate to other overhead departments and then to the revenue producing departments. B is the right answer. Okay. So we don't have much time left. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is orient you towards what other things to study for the exam. I figure that's probably the best thing I can do for you at this point. Uh, the section on the 990 form, which is next in the book, is extremely interesting. 
but is not going to be one out of which you need to know a great deal of detail. Uh, however, if you really want to understand healthcare, you need to know what information is reported to the IRS. And uh, I think this section does a, a pretty good job explaining what that is, how an organization can self-describe its mission and activities, how it reports its unrelated business income, which is income it derives from uh, 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 functions that are unrelated to its uh, tax exempt purpose. And a couple of examples would be if your hospital acts as a uh, referral lab uh, and attracts referral uh, lab specimens from other facilities, it is competing against LabCorp and Quest. You know, that's some, these are companies that Brad was mentioning a little while ago. So to create a level playing field, the tax exempt organization has to pay income tax on that revenue. HFMA, which is a tax exempt organization as well, our professional association, has to pay income taxes on its advertising revenue because it is unrelated business income. So that's important to know. And then, of course, there's compensation information. What you pay the CEO and, and other highly compensated officers is part of the 990 form. You can look it up on the internet. And then there is a form that's called the H schedule, Schedule H, that uh, uh, those of you who work in the revenue cycle should take a very close look at because this is information that pertains to what you do, although you may never have seen the Schedule H before because the CFO prepares it and doesn't show it to you. But take a look at Schedule H, okay? Um, okay, so that this is just, I think, useful background information, not necessarily that important for the exam. Uh, we've already covered the disbursement section and thus need to do not need to spend a lot of time on that. But uh, what we haven't spent time on is this section on contract management. It's the weakest section in the online study guide and I'm not sure my material is all that strong either because I'm a little bit at a loss as, as to how to best teach this. But this is the section where the business associate agreement would be discussed. And we already talked about it, and I'm going to send that to you. And then the other things that are, I think, worth uh, your time is uh, the, the section that starts on page 163, and that is just a quick run through, through managed care and managed care organizations just very quickly scrolling through this and practice models. So that's worth learning. And then, and I'm still scrolling here, sorry about this. And then when it comes here, just generally about contracts, okay? Generally about contracts. You will remember this from business, your business law classes. What are the uh, four elements of a valid contract? And then how does this stuff apply to healthcare? And it does in the sense of emancipated minors. It's the only real way in which this touches upon healthcare specifically. And then here's a section that uh, talks about boilerplate provisions in any healthcare contract. Um, this is important to know, and I think there are some questions on this, so look at that. And then here are a description of things that would be customized in a particular contract, including such a topic as coordination of benefits and a definition of a clean claim and timely payment provisions right here and denials and so forth. You know what uh, Brad was saying that uh, Medicaid no longer pays for in-house lab work. That would be spelled out in you know, your contract that you have with uh, your TenCare. If it's a managed care plan, it would be all spelled out in the contract. So, so that's in here. Then a little bit about subrogation, which is a big uh, word and a scary word, especially if we don't know what it is. So I'm describing what subrogation is. I'm describing what a lien is. Again, something that we kind of sort of know but aren't necessarily very familiar with. And then I have a kind of a nice example here of how coordination of benefits works 
on page 173. So take a close look at the different ways in which coordination of benefits uh, is determined between payer A and payer B. They don't both want to pay the whole claim uh, and, and how this actually happens. Uh, and this carve-out is the way it mostly works today. This is the most prevalent way in which coordination of benefits these days works. So if you have the, the stomach to uh, uh, read all of this and make it through all of this, these are generally not quantitative topics anymore other than the ones we talked about at the beginning of today, I think you will be in good shape. In good shape for the exam. This brings us again to the end of a full two-hour class. I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope it was meaningful. And uh, don't worry too much about this stuff. In case you do wonder, Christoph, where, what about uh, uh, the ACA, about healthcare reform? There's none of what you've talked about for eight hours really is about healthcare reform. The answer to that is that is correct. That has not yet made it into the exam material. Uh, it will, however, next year. So what I have in my material in the contract section, which I told you is uh, uh, not all that good because I don't know what there really is to talk about other than the topics that I just talked about. I have a long section that starts here on page, uh, where does it start? on page 174, which I call the next frontier, value-based contracting. So insofar as you want to uh, beef up your own knowledge of what, uh, what probably will start showing up on the exam next year out of healthcare reform, it's going to be this stuff that starts on page 174. And it's interesting reading, um, and I recommend it highly. Uh, because this is stuff we all need to know, and, uh, including myself, and I've tried to put as much of it as I can in here so you understand how it works. Okay, thank you for your time and your attention. I look forward to uh, meeting up with you again on uh, November 4th. This gives you four weeks now to uh, study this material. And hopefully even some of you will have taken the exam before the uh, 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 November the 4th, I mean, when we meet again. So I don't expect you back. But do me the favor, those of you who pass the exam, do send me an email uh, to my email address. And you have that, I think, on the front page. Yes. Uh, I want to know how you did, what your experiences with the exam are, and whether what you learned here was helpful or not. So best wishes for the next month uh, with budgets and whatever else uh, you have on your plates. Look forward to see you again uh, in another month. Be well and take care. Thank you, Christoph. And just a reminder, we will have the uh, the recording and any handouts and anything else posted up by uh, end of the day tomorrow. Thank you.